I always like to see how long I can hold that for <laughs> the silence. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Clive Holland, uh, and I'm the Principal and Vice-Chancellor here at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Uh, it's a privilege this evening to welcome you here, welcome you here to Murray College and to this particular building. Uh, tonight, we will have an inaugural lecture from Professor Magib Kamel Boulos, our newly appointed Professor of Digital Health. But before I go into the rest of the speech, I just want to say a little bit about professorial lectures. Um, professorial lectures are important events in the life of any university. Um, they give the candidate the opportunity to demonstrate their excellence in either their research, their teaching, or their academic leadership. Um, tonight, I am sure, we will get that excellence from my group. Okay. Uh, it is important for the University of the Highlands and Islands to serve the needs of the communities in which it is based, as well as providing an innovative student experience that is relevant to key industry sectors, serving the needs of our communities, and also involves having a strong focus on existing and potential um, industry needs, so that can we can work with them to provide the skills and innovation necessary to help our communities thrive. In that respect, we find ourselves sitting in a building that is evidence of that focus. The Alexander Graham Bell Center is a hub for research and education in digital health, which has been identified as an area of special interest in the Murray region, and in which Murray College, UHI, works in partnership with Grampian NHS. The Alexander Graham Bell Center is Europe's first Rural Centre for Digital Health, and it represents a unique collaboration between key partners, including NHS Grampian, Murray College UHI, the University of the Highlands and Islands, and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. This new extension to Murray College is designed to bring business, academia, and healthcare together, and it supports groundbreaking work already been carried out by researchers and practitioners in digital healthcare in the Murray region. As further evidence of the commitment of the University of the Highlands and Islands in this initiative, we are developing this body of research and collaboration with the introduction of our new Professor of Digital Health. Professor Magid Kamel Boulos is here tonight to present his inaugural lecture. However, prior to taking up this post, Professor Boulos was Associate professor, professor of Health Informatics at Plymouth University. Prior to this, he worked as a lecturer in healthcare informatics at the University of Bath, where he was instrumental in developing the online MSc program in healthcare informatics, which was delivered jointly with the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. Professor Boulos has a medical degree and is a master in dermatology. He also holds a master's in medical informatics from King's College London and a PhD in measurement and information in medicine from City University London. His PhD focused on developing novel knowledge management and visualization techniques for browsing and finding information on the healthcare cyberspace using hypermedia geographic information systems. His research at the University of the Highlands and Islands involves bringing together elements of healthcare, smart technology, and the internet for the development of digital healthcare systems, especially in rural areas such as ours. We recently received a great deal of attention in the media for Professor Boulos's subject of research, which resembles a Disney film recently released by the name of Big Hero 6, where a digital healthcare robot is invented by a university scholar. 
Apparently, this fictional character is not too far away from reality. And we may see some evidence of that this evening. Indeed, we will watch Professor Boulos's research with close interest, and I am delighted to welcome him here tonight as he presents his inaugural lecture entitled Creating a Self-Aware, Smart and Healthy Highlands and Islands Region Using the Internet of Things and People. Please welcome Professor Magid Kamil Boulos. Thank you very much. Let me thank you all for being with us here today. Uh, I would like to talk today about a topic directly relevant to the region we are based in, uh, the region our university is named after, the Highlands and Islands. Uh, it's about creating a self-aware, smart and healthy Highlands and Islands region using the Internet of Things and People. Some of you might have seen this article in BBC News. Uh, it was a coverage about this lecture and many of you uh, might be expecting me to talk today about health and healthcare robots. Uh, well, uh, today's focus won't be really about robots. Uh, although uh, I have a research interest in robots, I published a lot about them. I have been uh, at the House of Commons a year and a half ago uh, presenting our NOW version. This is a humanoid robot manufactured in France called NOW, and we had applications for it for people with dementia and for other health conditions. And we presented about this uh, to the members of parliament. Uh, also, there are other health-related robots. I'm providing some photos of these uh, robots. So it's a, a, an emerging and booming uh, field of research. And in fact, uh, we are planning some work to do with healthcare robots in the uh, not so distant future here at this center, the Alexander Graham Bell Center in Digi of Digital Health. Today I'm going to talk about smart cities, but let me start by uh, introducing the foundation of smart cities. The technology that powers smart cities is known as the Internet of Things, and I prefer to add to it the word and people, uh, because I, I feel it's, it's, it's not very appropriate to consider people as yet other things added to our uh, uh, bunches of things. So I, I like to have the distinction between things and people. I'll provide some examples. I'll provide some ideas about the foundation standards and protocols, then move on to present about in, uh, Internet of Things powered cities using the case study of Barcelona and one of its suburbs. Then I will also show how the Internet of Things is not just linking devices uh, to the cloud and with each other, but also linking people to people and helping with the social inclusion in our digital age. Uh, also, I will then talk about the distributed city model, which is uh, the version of the smart cities uh, as applied to uh, rural or uh, uh, less populated uh, areas like the highlands and islands. I will also mention some concerns about the Internet of Things and smart cities to do with privacy and security and uh, give some idea about how we benchmark or measure our progress in smart cities, how we measure uh, the impact of smart cities on the life, the health, the well-being, the happiness of people, and conclude with some take-home messages and also with some practical points for the highlands and islands. Where and how do we begin? The Internet of Things and People is uh, now a, a term in the uh, Oxford Dictionaries, has been introduced to the Oxford Dictionaries in uh, 2013. Uh, the Internet of Things enables almost everything around us, including ourselves, objects, uh, our planet and the universe, to be automatically identified and located, to be instrumented and queried to get data from those different objects from our bodies, and to be uh, connected and interconnected uh, to cloud servers and devices connected to each other as well. And uh, all of this with the purpose of being able to 
process and analyze these streams of data to improve, to improve our lives. So the result is or should be smarter things and smarter environments in which people and objects interact and cooperate with each other in new ways that can vastly improve our quality of life. And one concept that emerged from the Internet of Things uh, to do with digital health is the concept of the quantified self, whereby it's today very possible to measure almost everything in our bodies, our cells, our organs, and get streams of data in real time uh, for analysis uh, on the cloud. Uh, we have all kinds of wearables, gadgets these days, smart watches, smart garments. I personally worked on a project called uh, eCalyx, which was one of three projects I was involved in with the uh, acronym Calyx in the, in the name, Calyx, eCalyx, and Calyx MV. And in eCalyx, we used a smart garment, an undervest made of smart textile, which you would treat as ordinary textile, ordinary clothes, fabric, uh, but this textile has got sensors for ECG, for body temperature, for uh, respiratory rate, and it can communicate all those uh, measurements in real time wirelessly to a smartphone hub uh, held by the patient. Connected things do not just send uh, data or measurements to the cloud, but they can receive orders, they can execute actions uh, triggered by the, uh, the, the, the processing uh, system on the cloud. So they can be remotely controlled. Uh, I would like to mention here uh, one example where uh, the sensors are actually us, the human beings. Uh, so when we talk about sensors, people think about devices uh, and uh, they kind of detach people from those devices. But there is an opportunity for citizens to act as sensors. And in fact, citizen sensing is now a, a sub-discipline uh, uh, recognized with this name and uh, has got many applications, including in health and health care. For example, it's used in environmental surveillance where citizens uh, buy those air quality eggs. These are small devices with built-in sensors that can measure uh, various uh, uh, elements of air quality and send those measurements to the cloud for processing. The, the, the measurements are then collated per region, per city, per street level even, and uh, you can browse them on a map and get a real-time, up-to-date information about air quality. This is something that governments cannot do at most in a big city. Uh, they would have several monitoring, air quality monitoring stations, but now they can have uh, thousands and even millions of those stations. Uh, just everyone who gets one of those uh, very low-cost uh, eggs can become an air monitoring uh, uh, station and have it in their house and contribute to a global map. So how do we create a smart thing or smart object? Let's assume this seat, it's a thing. Uh, there are many seats around here uh, and we want to make it a smart object. First, we need to have a unique identifier uh, that enables us to identify this seat from among very many similar seats in this room and elsewhere, and to be able to link to or call that seat from anywhere in the world, and we know exactly that this is the seat we want. So we need to assign a unique identity, and this is provided by the internet protocol, like an IP address. You know the IP address? It's exactly an IP address. Uh, you can have a unique address uh, allocated to that uh, thing or seat, uh, then you need that seat to perform some sensing, to be smart, to be able to recognize its environment. So you give it sensors like we have our ears, our eyes, our sense of touch. So the same, you can give it sensors, whatever sensors you need to achieve the purpose you have in mind. It can have, for example, a sensor to recognize that it is occupied or vacant, a pressure sensor. It can have a sensor that can read the tag on the, uh, uh, the person sitting on it and recognize the identity of that person. So I know that John is sitting on this seat or someone else. And I can also control that seat remotely. So I'm not just reading the status of the seat remotely, but can even perform actions. I assume I, for example, don't like the person sitting on that seat, so I can eject them. If I design some actuators and some uh, motor and put it there, then this can happen. 
So all of these are possibilities, and that's how we create smart things. In fact, you don't need really sensors and hardware to play with the Internet of Things. If you are really keen to uh, experiment with the Internet of Things, IBM has created a simulator that allows you to create sensors in your web browser, on your smartphone, and to try and play with all the concepts of the Internet of Things without having the actual hardware. I would encourage you really to, to use this one. Uh, this was made really for use in a workshop where there was an opportunity for uh, all of us to, to, to experiment together. Uh, this was in Athens in Greece, but uh, uh, in this context here, I'm just offering the link for those who are interested. Now the boundaries between the digital and the physical are getting blurred. Uh, today we have, for example, um, many apps on our smartphones that recognize where we are, and then, for example, if you use your smartphone camera and uh, point it at some landmark or some place, it can triangulate what it sees uh, from, through the camera and your location as detected by the wireless uh, services on the smartphone and the GPS on the smartphone, and then call the cloud servers to fetch and get you information about what you are now uh, seeing, where you are standing now, tells you about the history of that landmark, uh, tells you about spaces to uh, visit around that landmark, places to eat, and it's all done almost automatically. It recognizes that you are in Trafalgar Square and gives you the relevant information. So there is this awareness and this fusion between the world around us and the, 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 the knowledge and the, the cloud-based uh, digital uh, bits and all of them are brought together to help us uh, live better. This is an example of an IoT-powered thing related to health. It's just trying to, to bring this from YouTube. It's not on YouTube. The next slide has got a, a cache copy of it, but I'm... Uh, So let's see this smart... Imagine everything was linked. Let's say an elderly person forgot to take a pill prescribed by the doctor. This could trigger an alert warning a family member on their mobile phone. If that person is not available, it would make a call to a second family member. Now if this person is also unavailable, it could then alert a local emergency center, which would send someone to check things out. Imagine we had an internet of things. Wouldn't that save a lot of lives? The same can be for vehicles. Vehicles around us uh, could also be connected. And in fact, this vision is now in development uh, across the EU. And there are emerging standards to govern this. And there are many uh, health implications for this, uh, not just for ambulance cars and faster dispatch times, but even for, ra for road safety, uh, which is part of, the, of our general health and well-being. I'll just try to disconnect the internet because it seems to be causing problem here. It doesn't allow me to disconnect and it doesn't allow to get the, the, the sort of the, the cover picture of the video from YouTube.
So this smart uh, vision for cars, the connected cars, is becoming a reality. And in fact, it has got many also uh, security hazards and implications we, we will discuss uh, later. Imagine everything was linked. Let's say there was a traffic accident somewhere on the road. A built-in system in the cars could automatically alert the emergency services. With precise geolocation data, they can send an ambulance to the crash site. Furthermore, this new information would be passed on to a system that alerts me as I'm driving and suggests an alternative route to get to my destination. Imagine we had an Internet of Things. Wouldn't that be more efficient? So to make this vision a reality, we need standards and protocols. Uh, we found that IP4, which was the standard we, we are even still using today, for addressing on the uh, internet is not enough. We have many more objects and things we want to uniquely identify than what is allowed by 32-bit addressing system. So that's why we had to move to IPv6, which allows a 128-bit uh, addressing system, which means we can have many more unique identifiers to connect many more objects, billions of these objects by 2020. There are other standards to do with data plumbing, you are sending loads of data and you need to ensure everything goes smoothly. Standards to do with personal area networks when you are instrumenting the human body, sending measurements from various parts of the body. Standards to do with healthcare delivery uh, using those connected health systems. And these are managed by a bunch of, uh, of, of kite marking uh, sort of guidelines uh, ma managed by the Continuum Health Alliance. We call them uh, Continuum Health Alliance standards. They are currently at version 2015, but they're actually a, a compilation of IEEE and other relevant standards in this respect. All of these enable things to work seamlessly in a plug-and-play fashion so that devices from various manufacturers can talk to each other seamlessly. It's uh, kind of an ecosystem that we are building. And of course, when you think about sensors and streams of data, you start thinking about the huge amounts of data we are uh, accumulating, uh, we are generating and accumulating. Uh, when we talk about big data, we think about the big volume of the data, the high velocity uh, at which these data are generated. They are generated in real time or near real time. The high variety, many data streams, uh, and also, uh, we also, as uh, people working in digital health, we are very keen to have high quality data. We have a V for veracity to emphasize the importance of establishing data trustworthiness and accuracy. Uh, but definitely, those big data can sometimes be even more accurate than the conventional systems of, uh, uh, of early warning. For example, this crowd map here was uh, generated by the people, the citizens in Beijing, using their uh, smartphones, their mobile phones, and uh, proved to be better than the Chinese uh, government in uh, predicting and visualizing uh, the, the floods and their progress. This was uh, three years ago. If you just take uh, a funny example, uh, farmers, for example, these days uh, are offered the opportunity to have uh, sensors attached to their cows for uh, economic uh, benefits to improve milk production, to uh, have better uh, animal health, which has got its implications for humans. And a single cow would generate 200 megabytes of data uh, per year. Uh, of course, when you move to the human body and the area of the quantified self, we have uh, uh, many dozens more of this amount of data generated per single individual. And uh, we have many devices today that generate loads of data, smart watches, the one uh, currently uh, released by Apple or about to be released, the Fitbit devices, the Microsoft Band, and these are very sophisticated. They have uh, uh, various sensors, heart rate sensors, and they can monitor many things, monitor your sleep, your activity levels. The challenge here is to make sense of all of those data. Uh, you can always use analytics, which is uh, a term uh, meaning analysis, and you can use them at three levels. 
uh, at a descriptive level where we are trying just to make sense, to understand, to visualize the picture around us as painted or described by those data, then uh, you start taking actions. So you move into the area of prescriptive analytics where you are trying to prescribe or offer choices to the decision maker to help them uh, find a solution or resolve the problem. And you can also help the decision making, maker by offering them predictive or anticipatory analytics where you try to tell them what will happen in the future, kind of future scenarios based on the current status, the current data we have. And the where component, the location component, adds a lot to this. It adds lots of intelligence because many things are shaped by the places where they happen, where they are. And to better understand those things and to better act, you need to know the characteristics of the location of the locations. And when this is taken into consideration, it adds a very important dimension. But we need not be deceived by big data. Many people think big data is the, the next uh, sort of uh, the, the thing that will solve the whole world problems and is, is just reliable, is a new technology, it must be uh, great. But we need to treat it with, with humility. We need to be humble to recognize our error bars, uh, to uh, add these to any inferred predictions, to also pair this with conventional data collection. This is not out of fashion. It will always remain important. What we call small data is always needed. And in fact, uh, I will give here two examples. One which is quite positive to do with the e Ebola uh, virus spread. They used smartphone data uh, from West Africa to uh, map population movements and uh, predict the spread of the virus and try to mitigate or contain uh, that spread. Uh, at the same uh, time, we know about Google flu, flu trends, and they also used it for dengue fever and for other conditions. And when these were first released, these tools, uh, the world said this will be even more accurate than the CDC uh, own ways to detect early outbreaks. This is partially true. It's not totally uh, untrue, but it's not also totally true or very accurate. It's partially true. Uh, only now we know it's partially true, and there is a very nice paper I advise anyone interested to read. It's called The Parable of Google Flu the traps in big data analysis. And it reminds us that we always need to remember the small data and to combine things or couple things together. And today we are even moving away from big data as such. It's not a big deal to have big data. Uh, in fact, if you can do the job with just small data or right size data, then do it. If you can do it with small or light analytics, then do it. This brute force can eat all sort of approach to data and analytics. Uh, it's just a, 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 selling, a, a salesperson trap from the company's marketing, those tools. But in reality, you need to focus on what you want to do, choose the right data, the right methods, and in this way you are avoiding the noise and increasing the accuracy and precision of whatever you are doing. And that's my advice and the advice of many scholars to cities and regions dealing with all those real-time streams of data. This is just a control room in the city of Hamburg and uh, they use it for traffic management, smart traffic management. All the roads have smart sensors uh, in the asphalt. It's, uh, it, it can detect many things. There are also sensors on the uh, lamp stands in the streets, and huge amounts of data come every day. They can even anticipate bottlenecks and mitigate uh, through appropriate actions. Let me now introduce the concept of IoT-powered cities, cities that take this concept of smart things and then uh, take it to become smart cities, smart living environments. Uh, let me quote uh, a quote by uh, Roberto Saraco, who is the chair of IEEE's Future Directions Committee. Uh, he mentioned two versions of cities, one made of atoms, you and me and cars, plants, animals, and all these sort of things. We are atoms. Then you have another version, which is a mirror city, which is made of bits, and the two are connected to one another you have sensors in the one, and it can connect to the other. This vision of smart cities covers every aspect of our lives. Smart governance, smart mobility and transport, smart energy, smart urban safety and policing, smart environment, smart tourism, smart education, smart living, smart economy, smart heritage, smart health, and smart health is currently witnessing the biggest shift 
it, it has ever witnessed uh, is the move from reactive mobile health, where we have those sensors that monitor everything, and the hope is that we catch things when they happen as early as possible and intervene as early as possible in a timely manner to mitigate uh, complications and improve outcomes. The move is now to proactive, where you don't wait for things to happen to detect them early, but you want to prevent them altogether from happening, and you want to do so actively, so you predict the risk, and then you tell the person, these are active modifications, say, in, li in your lifestyle, and you monitor the execution of those active lifestyle modifications, and you can see the risk level dropping. And in this case, you are preventing. So we are moving to something called P4 Smart Health. And the P4 stands for the four Ps of personalized, preventive, predictive, preventive, and participatory. You can do this without involving the person, putting them at the driving wheel. Barcelona to start this ambitious smart city project started by laying the, the foundation. The foundation here is the internet. You need to have a, a reliable underground fiber network and mobile network as well. Luckily here in the Highlands and Islands, we have an ambitious program of uh, cable broadband for the whole region. What we are lacking at the moment is a, a similar program for mobile broadband. Both of them are needed to realize the, the internet of things. So they started to do this, and they did it in a clever way. They saw what needed to be done and the underground anyway. They were digging the streets anyway for other reasons, and they managed to bring all the work together so that they save on costs, and they move in a systematic way, reducing costs and connecting the whole city together. Then they used this. First thing, they had those smart solar panel-powered bus stops, and these bus stops are connected to the Internet, they provide real-time bus information. They even allow you to have a USB charging of your devices. They have a hotspot so that you can connect to the internet while waiting for a bus. They also provided people with smart parking spots. Those small sensors you can see embedded in the asphalt. Uh, combination of light and metal detectors. And they are connected to a smart app that you download on your smartphone. And through that app, it will detect your current location and that you want a parking spot and will tell you where is the nearest vacant parking spot and even guide you to that spot. And in the case of Barcelona, they charge money for this. So it will also handle the transaction and in this way increase the revenue of the city. You can't imagine how much this could uh, uh, contribute to reducing the, the air pollution and noise in a city because it has been said in any large city, I assume Inverness might be the same as well to some extent, at least three out of every 10 cars roaming in the streets uh, is looking for a parking space. At least in London, these things would be true. They also have a city-wide network of sensors. They use those uh, uh, lamp stands to uh, attach sensors for everything you could imagine, noise sensing, uh, environment and air quality sensing, uh, light sensing. Uh, they have the LED uh, diodes in those street lights, which can save uh, uh, en uh, energy consumption. But they are also smart in that they can detect movements in the street and uh, they can increase the light or dim the light accordingly. When the street is very quiet, no one is passing by. It just dims the light, reduces the light pollution, and also electricity saves energy. Uh, lots of uh, potential for these, and they can know where are the areas that require attention later on. For example, through this noise sensing network, they can know that this uh, area of the city reaches very high noise levels at a certain time of the day, and perhaps we need to redirect traffic or find a solution because it's not healthy for people living in this area to just uh, sustain this uh, every day for an hour or two. So they can detect these things which would go unnoticed without such sensing. They also have smart meters, and here in the UK we have a similar ambitious program whereby the government wants to roll out smart meters in every home in the country uh, by 2020. I tried to, 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 to put myself, our home, on... Uh, the list for smart meters that have been told it is not yet ready for Elgin or the Highlands, but hopefully it's on its way. And those meters 
don't need anyone to read them. They are connected to the internet. They send the readings. They don't need anyone to, to come to read them or you send your readings. One more important thing is that they can control the electricity. If you are willing to give up some of your freedom as to when you are going to turn on your dishwasher or washing machine and give it to the, mach to the sensor to control it, then you can save a lot, help towards a greener environment, but at the same time save in terms of lower energy bills because it will select the best time of the day when energy is green and cheapest and turn on your machine. But this might be at 11 p.m. for the dishwasher, not the best time you'd like to turn it on. And of course, you have the right to override this if you want to pay the full bill. So these smart meters, electric cars, and when you think about electric vehicles, you think about connectivity as well and a, a network of recharge points across the country. I mean, these things cannot be just done on a, on a small initiative level. They be, need to be done on a wide level. Even their garbage bins are wirelessly connected. And instead of sending the trucks across a, a predetermined uh, journey every week or every three days to go through all the bins to empty them, and maybe half of them do not need any emptying, and you are just sending the trucks in the streets, making noise, consuming fuel, contributing to air pollution as well. And uh, you could save all of this by just making a custom trajectory for the trucks to just go to those bins that need emptying, thanks to your knowledge, your central uh, information that you got about the status of the different bins, which are empty and which are full. In fact, in some areas of Barcelona, they even got an underground network and vacuum emptying of the bins, so they don't even need to send trucks at all, and that's perhaps the best waste management solution. All of these things have very direct health implications, because this is about the environment we live in, the air we breathe, the quality of our life. Even our plants can benefit, and we benefit uh, in turn. This is not just unique to uh, Barcelona. In fact, uh, the city of Milton Keynes here in the UK has got exactly the same system. Uh, and thanks to sensors in the soil, which detect humidity and detect also the temperature and with the weather forecast and other uh, sensed elements, we can make uh, intelligent decisions automatically as to when we need to irrigate those uh, uh, parks and the irrigation is automatic and the quantity is also controlled how much water you, you use. We all know that under irrigation is harmful for plants, but also over irrigation is equally harmful for plants. So we are saving on waters, we have healthier plants, healthier environment. Uh, that's uh, the same problem again with the videos. So the next video is not actually the main Barcelona video, and I chose it on this purpose because there are lots of videos about the smart city developments in Barcelona produced by the, the, the equivalent of the city council of, of Barcelona. I chose this one because it comes from a suburb, a small area similar to the towns you find in the highlands and islands. And uh, they joined this initiative, and they had the capacity, and they wanted to do it, even though they are small, and small in number, and... Uh, uh, this didn't prevent them from joining forces with the neighbor nearby big city of Barcelona to, be, to benefit from the, the, the economy of scale that is present there. Cucat is a green and sustainable town that offers a high quality and healthy lifestyle, especially for families. Our city is dynamic and vibrant, and we are ready to face the challenges of the future. You want to become a benchmark smart city. Being smart means collaborating in order to be innovative, creative and efficient. As a city, this will allow us to improve our quality of life. Today, we take one step further along this path we have led with a new pilot project. We have created a space for innovation the technology will be at the citizen's service. They have chosen an area of the town to test new systems on green areas, mobility, waste management, and street lighting. We have the places 
We have the tools and we have the people. We are ready. We already took a step forward in waste management with recycling. Now we want to improve our waste collection services in order to know exactly when a garbage truck is required to collect rubbish. There are some ultrasound sensors placed in the back of each waste container that detect whether it is full or empty. With every bag thrown in the container, the sensors generate new data that automatically are sent to a control center. When the rubbish container is full, the waste collection is programmed. This way, you can adapt the retail schedules of the garbage trucks to real needs. We save money and we avoid inconveniences to citizenship. Our town has many parks and gardens that need permanent care. In order to have them look nice and green, we have to manage their irrigation needs. For this purpose, we have installed sensors that allow us to know the degree of humidity of the soil and the air temperature in order to determine the exact amount of water needed. By watering only when necessary, we are saving up to 20% of water and we are taking better care of our parks. Three out of ten cars driving around the center of our city are looking for a parking space. In the pilot project, drivers have an easy and fast way to know where to park with the information panels. The information displayed tells drivers how many free parking spaces there are and which direction they must go in order to find them. This data are obtained from the sensors placed in each one of the surface parking spaces. With this system, we prevent the waste of time and facilitate a fluid flow of traffic. We spend less petrol and protect the environment. Street lamps are smart in the innovation area. They determine the amount of light required depending on the time of day and the kind of street where they are installed. Street lamps increase the intensity of light when they detect movement and sound around them. With a sensor in every street lamp, we spend only what is needed, we reduce light pollution, and we can detect breakdowns quickly. This pilot project means one more step to turn our city into a smart city, to make San Cugat become a more efficient, competent, and sustainable city. We want to be an innovative city at the citizen's service, and this is just the beginning. So this is a suburb of Barcelona, not the Barcelona city proper. So what were the effects or early impacts of this uh, smart city uh, revolution in, in Barcelona? They were able to create 47,000 new jobs in a matter of a few years, two to three years. All of these jobs are around IoT, Internet of Things related uh, developments for the smart city. They also were able to increase their revenues uh, in terms of water savings, in terms of increased revenues for parking fees, uh, and it, it, it's still uh, uh, in development. There are more benefits to reap uh, uh, in the long term. The most important thing is that all of this is done uh, towards a better quality of life for citizens and visitors. It's not just uh, this uh, smart city of Barcelona. Nice has got similar developments. Hamburg in Germany, Milton Keynes in uh, England, many, many more cities, dozens of them uh, in Europe and uh, hundreds of them around the world. Uh, I'm not sure if we are locked again because of the YouTube uh, thumbnails, the, the cover picture for uh, embedded YouTube videos. So now we move to the next, I consider the most important thing is really about social empathy, about using this technology, harnessing it towards linking people to people. Uh, today we live in a world which has been described as a lonely world. Uh, although we have more and more uh, devices that enable us to connect with each other, more social media, 
more uh, Facebook and Twitter and all the like, but people are not talking to each other, are not uh, sympathizing with each other. In fact, just in the news this morning, I read about a small device that you can have on your table. It's, uh, it's like a pepper uh, mill. And when you shake it as the parent, it turns off all the TV and Wi-Fi for a set duration, like 30 minutes, to enable the family to have a proper dinner or meal together, to talk to each other rather than each one talking to their smartphone. So definitely there are benefits, social benefits from these social media, but in a sense also they sometimes bring people more apart rather than more together. Uh, still, we can benefit from them, and uh, social inclusion is a very important concept for healthy aging, and in fact for healthy living of all age groups, not just older people. And there is research evidence that shows that training older people in social me media carries the potential of improving well-being and combating social isolation. In particular, there is a research project, an European-funded project called Ages 2.0, that just investigated this uh, aspect and uh, drew these conclusions based on the evidence they gathered. Various studies have shown that people with better social support suffer less heart attacks, have more protection from serious complications following stroke, for example, greater tissue repair, faster recovery from illness, can fight cancer better, can keep memories for longer, live a longer, healthier life. Uh, even health literacy decline has been shown to, uh, to, to be prevented during aging uh, independent of cognitive decline, thanks to internet use and social engagement. There is evidence also that helping and supporting others can make people of all ages happier and healthier. So this is a big opportunity to link people to people. Uh, uh, and uh, I intentionally changed or added to the name the conventional term Internet of Things and people because I wanted to emphasize people. At the end of the day, all of these things should be for people. Uh, we are not doing these things for our devices. We are doing it for us. And the best thing to do is to link people to people. Imagine a smart home community-based service to allow collective baby and child care among neighbors. This is now a reality, thanks to the Internet of Things. Imagine a car-sharing service that combines social interactions with people offering to help each other. Uh, like, I, I have my car free. I'm going this direction. Can take you uh, to work with me. Uh, and people also have the opportunity to have to add driver ratings. I uh, took uh, this car this morning. I like that driver. He's a kind man or kind woman. Uh, or this is an aggressive driver. Please avoid. You can also offer incentives because when you carry many people with you to work, for example, the more you carry people, you get a bonus on some kind of digital card. Then later on, when you refuel your car, you can get a discount on fuel because you are helpful to your community. So that's how you, 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 you sort of stimulate or uh, encourage people to uh, use these services or to, to help each other. You can imagine refranchising older and also younger unemployed people via e-labor exchange services, further helped by the Connected European Digital Single Market Initiative. Today we have, for example, services like Elance. It connects many people together I have a job to be done, I go to Elance, offer my job details and the money I'm ready to pay, and I have time to do work for others, I go there, put my CV, my skills, and the, the, the money I'm charging and the time I'm available to do the, the work. And then it's a, a matchmaking process uh, done uh, online. It's a marketplace of e-labor, like eBay for goods, but this is for human skills and, and, and work. So this is helping lots of people to rejoin the, 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 the labor space. Older people with many skills, many of them, for example, were in their lives, say, they, they were professional translators. Why not, in your spare time, translate some work for others and get some money in return as well? And you can do all of this uh, in the convenience of your own home through the Internet you don't need to move to a workplace to do this. And you are contributing to the economy at the same time and to your self-fulfillment and well-being as an individual, feeling that you are still useful and contributing to the society. Uh, in fact, the city of Barcelona, again, I'm very impressed by the work they are doing. Uh, they created an app called uh, Winkels BCN. This app is an award-winning app. Uh, and this app was aimed at helping 
Barcelona, as older people develop and maintain stronger social ties and networks with trusted and secure circles of social workers, volunteers, neighbors, friends, and families. And the, the app allows them to do uh, all sorts of activities like making calls, such as making calls, sending and receiving uh, photos and videos, uh, sharing events, even transferring money. Let me show you a, a short uh, video clip about this app. And this is not just what they are doing, they are doing also apps for uh, uh, sexual health, smart health apps that are location aware and that are offered to sexually active uh, people, particularly young adults. And it kind of gives them preventive messages and also directs them to the, 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 the nearest places where they can have uh, uh, preventive measures for sexually transmitted infections when they are in close proximity with areas of the city known to have lots of uh, uh, encounters of this kind at certain times of the day. The app automatically senses your surrounding, the time of the day, the location where you are, and in a non-intrusive, very private uh, manner, offers you the advice, offers you where to get condoms, etc. And it's being rolled out by their public health directorate. It's a very good example of a location-aware smart health uh, service. Uh, let me now talk about how all of this could apply to the highlands and the islands. We all uh, saw big cities here, Barcelona's and the like. Uh, what about our region? 
uh, first of all, uh, rural populations are shrinking worldwide. This is a phenomenon we cannot stop. From 70% of the world population in 1950 living in rural areas to 40% will be living in rural areas by 2030. Currently, at this point in time, in 2015, we are at 46% only living in rural areas, mean, meaning that those who are living in cities now uh, have outnumbered those in rural areas. This is one of the major demographic uh, shifts over the past 80 years. While acknowledging that no one size fits all, I'm not saying we bring this Barcelona model and implement it uh, as it is here in, in the Highlands, probably it will not work as such. Uh, still, there is the, the element of the economies of scale, which is determined by the size of the population to be served by a given Internet of Things service. Usually, this plays an important and decisive role when you are deploying sustainable, smart services that are meant to be cost-efficient, cost-effective, and good value for taxpayers' money. Smaller towns and villages tend to be left at disadvantage because of their much smaller population sizes and modest local capacities and resources, all of which make the deployment of some IoT-driven smart services prohibitively expensive and non-viable at such limited scales. However, there is no reason why the populations of smaller and rural settlements should be left lagging behind, especially when one considers the negative consequences in terms of the difficulty these regions have in retaining their best local skills and stopping the eventual brain drain of young professionals to the surrounding larger, more attractive and more opportunity-filled cities. We, we can just remember a few slides ago the example of that suburb of Barcelona, as a suburb is very similar to some towns in the Highlands, couldn't do it on its own, it joined forces with the bigger parent city, the nearby city, it uses the infrastructure and the capacity there. And that's how things work and can become viable. It has been said that there is power in unity, and this cannot be truer than in the case of small neighboring towns and villages, such as the Scottish Highlands and Islands, as well as sparsely populated regions in the Nordic countries, such as Finland. When these regions unite together to reach the required economies of scale, when their local populations and resources are pooled together under some suitable single administrative umbrella to form a large distributed city. We can't have the smart city of Elgin as such with our small uh, town or city council handing all of this. It cannot be done, it's not viable, it's not technically possible. You can do a demonstrator, but to do a sustainable service that is cost efficient and cost effective and will run for a lifetime, you cannot. But for this pooling and subsequent deployment of smart services to occur and succeed, the smaller settlements within a distributed city will need to be well connected with each other and the rest of the country by a good network of physical roads. We do have this to a very big extent. And also uh, to have a reliable connection of high-speed cable internet. We are starting to have this, expected to have it completed uh, across the highlands and islands by uh, 2017. Uh, but what we don't have really is the mobile bit. We have very poor mobile coverage. If you move by the train between Elgin and Inverness, you won't have a signal, a reliable signal for most of the time. So you can't speak about connected cars, connected emergency services. All of these things are far from being real. But again, it reminds us that really it needs a high level uh, intervention from the policymakers, big money coming from the government. No single small company or small town can do these things on its own. A distributed city of this kind can potentially then become a magnet for young and skilled professionals. In fact, it will become in a positive sense because I know when I say the word urbanized, people then think about all the negative things to do with urbanization. Uh, but it will become eventually, as you see the trend, 40%, 2030, maybe by 2080, the, the rural, the purely rural convention, rural areas would be just 20%. Everything is moving to, 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 to become urban to city-like fashion. And uh, with, in this way, we can do it in a healthy way. We can uh, generate new economic growth, new job opportunities. We can remove the negative connotations generally associated with rurality, uh, while keeping what is good for rurality, such as the quiet and beautiful nature, the fresh air, the less crowded public spaces. 
So you can do a lot, and we can remember the successful model of Barcelona during these economic uh, uh, hard times. Uh, they were able to create 47,000 jobs, and S Spain was one of those countries in Europe that were most affected by the economic crisis. But when we talk about IoT, smart cities, there is the issue of privacy and security as well. When things become connected, perhaps many of you know this already, you have your smartphone in your pocket, your uh, mobile service provider already knows your whereabouts. Of course, uh, there is kind of gentleman agreement uh, when it's signed the terms and, uh, and conditions. They also assure you that they will never release this information to any third party. But it is there, and there is the potential of misuse. So they know all your whereabouts or exactly the whereabouts of the phone because it might not, you, it might not be you who is holding or carrying the telephone at a certain point of time. But wherever this telephone is, it can be tracked and know, you can know where exactly, the, the, even sometimes to the very accurate coordinates, uh, house number where the, the telephone is. So uh, this raises many questions about misuse, about unauthorized sharing, unwanted advertising. Uh, let me share this example by uh, 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 Dr. John Barrett from the Cork Institute of Technology. He is just doing a mock-up screenshot of a a smartphone app which is tracking your health, say it detected some kind of health uh, emergency, angina or whatever, and it tells you your phone has called the emergency services and it is the, the ambulance is on its way. This is excellent. This is really what you want from those services. But imagine then the next step is it tries to sell you, in the meantime, their latest wonder drug or worse still, it notifies your insurance company and you receive a notification from the company that your premium has increased because you have, you have become a health liability, a risk for them, so they need to increase your premium. Today we all use smart TVs. This is perhaps the most popular smart gadget uh, in use, those internet-connected TVs, many of you, when they first operated them, you were faced with a screen with terms and conditions, and because you are excited and want to use the TV very fast, very quickly, so you just press OK, OK, and you got it up and running. You don't know what you have signed for in those terms and conditions. And worse still, when you go to the setup of those TV uh, sets, there is no option to turn off things that send your data to external parties. What we don't, uh, or some of us don't know or appreciate well is that those TV sets are sending on a daily basis everything you do with the TV, including your watching habits, viewing times, the channels you tune uh, to, and this is even done without the TV being on. Those who have a TV, when it is on standby, you find a small click at certain time of the day. The TV is operating, turning on without the screen, so the screen is off, but it's turning on, and through your connection to the Internet, is sending to the Samsung remote servers the daily log of what happened today. We don't have much control on this. Smart fridges are becoming also a reality, smart other things, and everything in our life is becoming instrumented in this way, and we don't own our lives anymore or our data. Where does the outside world stop and private space begin? What details of your life are you willing to share with strangers? this house every morning lights come on coffee brews automatically technology just like this is increasingly being installed into millions of homes across the world and it promises to change the way we live forever so there's sensors of all kinds there's lights and locks and thermostats and uh, once they're connected, then our platform can make them do whatever you want them to do. So as an example, if I wake up in the morning, the house knows that I'm, I'm waking up. It can wake up with me. When we walk in the kitchen, it will uh, play the local news and sort of greet us into the day, um, tell us the weather forecast so we know how to dress uh, for the day and so on. This technology is known as the Internet of Things, where the objects in our houses, kitchen appliances, anything electronic, can be connected to the internet. But for it to be useful, we're going to have to share intimate details of our private life. 
So this is the SmartThings uh, app. It can run on your mobile phone or on a tablet or something like that. I can do things like look at the comings and goings of family members. It can automatically detect when we come and go based on our mobile phones, or uh, you can have it detect your presence with a little sensor you can put in your car or something like that. So when we leave the house and there's no one home, that's when it'll lock up and shut down all of the electricity use and so on. For most of us, this is deeply private information. Yet once we hand it over, we have to trust a company to keep it confidential. The consumer really owns 100% of their own data, so they're opting in. It's not something where that data would ever be shared without their giving the permission. This house represents a new normal, where even the movements within our own home are documented and stored. It's a new frontier. The internet is asking us to redefine what we consider private. So let me just uh, finish this section by this quote by uh, Catherine uh, Albrecht and Katina Michael from their guest editorial uh, in one of the IEEE uh, prominent journals, Technology and Society magazine. Consumers may think we are in charge of our shopper cards, those loyalty cards, and our mobile apps, and our smart fridges, but let's not fool ourselves. The information is not ours. It belongs to Google, IBM, Cisco Systems, Global Megacorp that owns your local supermarket. If you don't believe it, just try removing your data from their databases. You are increasingly asked to log in. Now most of the services will keep you logged in. You go to your Gmail and then later on you discover that even Google search has you logged in. When you go to YouTube, you are already logged in because they sell it to you as one umbrella service, the Google services or platform. But by doing so, they learn a lot about you, which videos you watch, which searches you make. There are lots of information there, all very personal, all about you. And it's just the trick here is that they are offering you the free email. That's the, 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 the carrot to attract the person. And it's not just about the information or such uh, soft aspects. Even the devices, even things like insulin pumps, uh, pacemakers, it's very possible and has been demonstrated you can hack into a pacemaker and cause the loss of life. You can force an insulin pump remotely to deliver fatal dosage over the air and kill a person. You can hack a car because those connected cars can also be hacked to do accidents and kill persons. You can do all sorts of things. So uh, the devices as well and their security, which is harder to fix once you have a device, it's very hard to modify, uh, to release a new version, you need a new device. Sometimes you can control things by releasing new firmware, but firmware cannot just change everything in the design. So what we need to do here, uh, and we need to do it as early as possible, we need, first of all, to change our uh, design uh, concepts from focusing just on usability and convenience to a more security-minded approach to design. We need to offer users more control, the option to opt out. I want that smart TV to give me the option to opt out without banning me from the Internet, so I end up with a dumb TV. If I don't like Samsung to learn about my viewing habits, then I'm not allowed to connect to the Internet. doesn't make sense. Why should these things be linked together? I might become my own service provider. I run my own private cloud. It's technologically feasible, and it's one option that should be offered. The settings should be very friendly and clear to the ordinary lay person. And there is a report from the European uh, Commission that details uh, plans and sort of measures that should be adopted by manufacturers and providers for the next generation uh, Internet of Things solutions. Most importantly, uh, it has been uh, uh, mentioned in many places that we really need some visual and uh, sort of um, a mechanism that cannot be overridden by any way. Uh, this sort of mechanism could be a hardware button. Th those old switches, the old days when you had in the radios physical switches, you press or you push up and down, and you, you can even visibly from far tell the radio is on, the radio is off, or whatever and no one can remotely control your, your switch this way. We need those hardware switches. You can't imagine, this is a smart plant. You probably will find it at, the, at your nearest B&Q store very soon. It's already uh, on sale in London. This plant sends information to the internet. This information is coming out of my home. 
and I have no control on it. What I want to have is when I find that it is useful and uh, to my advantage to share information, I can control it, I share. When I want to share information, but maybe I don't want to share my location, why tell them I'm here? But maybe I need to tell them their location because then they can take into account the local weather in the smart irrigation of the plant to make it a healthier plant. So I will tell it when I want, I will switch it off when I want. What we don't want is the current generation currently on sale where you get these things and once you got them, you are forced to send those data and they keep coming out of your home and you never know with many devices sending data all around, uh, all the time, throughout the day, around the, the, all the year. With time, you are really giving away to others uh, a, a full profile of your life, exactly all the details, the intimate details, everything you did, even the things you like and you don't like. They can even tell you like those types of flowers. You never buy those types of flowers. That's exactly the older trick of loyalty cards. Loyalty cards were meant to further the interest of supermarkets because they can use them to track your buying habits, know what things are being bought most by you. And they, also they know your address. And earlier when you apply, they know other things to do with your personal profile. So they can sort of mesh up all of these, mesh up all of these data together and learn uh, who are the people who buy these sort of uh, items? Who are the, the, what are the income levels of those people? And what you don't know is that Tesco and Sainsbury's and others are selling your data also. In fact, Tesco has got a big firm, it's a spin-off company, which specializes in geodemographics. Geodemographics is a branch of science of selling data, for example, to advertisers. You have a, a, a newspaper campaign. You want to run a campaign to attract to recruit new students for the University of the Highlands and Islands. We cannot afford to run the campaign in all the major newspapers, every single newspaper. We probably want to be selective. But this question is which newspapers to select then those geodemographics will tell you, will tell you who buys which newspaper in which area and who doesn't. And then you know exactly if you want to target those people, better go for this particular newspaper. That's what they read in this area. And then you can save money. So these geodemographics are based on aggregates of consumer cars. So although they give you a 1% or 2% discount, those reward points, but they get much more in return. There are ways to measure. The question always in, in digital health is how to measure. Once you have rolled out something, we want to measure its impact, know if it's working or not working, how to improve it. Uh, there are many ways. The European Parliament uh, had a very ambitious initiative. They almost mapped all, mapped here is not just geographical mapping. Mapping means surveying, in a sense. All the smart cities across the European Union and compared them and tried to draw conclusions as to what are the parameters or elements, ingredients for success, uh, and what are the problems that could be uh, uh, later on uh, avoided when you develop smart cities. There is a European smart city model which has been developed within the framework of a European funded uh, framework program seven project at Technical University, Vienna University of Technology. Uh, this is a very uh, reliable model, although it focuses on medium sized cities because this, is, was, this was their remit. They don't take larger cities or smaller cities. There is the OECD and they have uh, developed uh, two indices worth mentioning here. One is the better life index and one is the Regional Wellbeing Index. The Better Life uh, Index covers the 34 OECD member countries. Uh, the Regional Wellbeing Index covers uh, 362 OECD regions, so it goes below the country level. It goes at a uh, regional level. For example, it covers the area of uh, the, the Catalonia, the region of Catalonia in Spain, which includes Barcelona with it rather than giving you all of, this, of, all of Spain as one uh, uh, unit. The good thing in those uh, measures and the big move and shift, and this was the focus of the uh, International Healthy Cities Conference in Athens in Greece, uh, which is run by the World Health Organization, the regional office for Europe. They focused this year on measuring happiness. And the OECD is actually leading the way by now moving uh, from the more conventional row system inputs that are uh, used or previously were used in measuring 
progress, such as indicators of material wealth or indicators of deprivation, GDP, and such economic statistics, they are now moving to positive outputs and their relation to health, well-being, and happiness as such. And for the first time, happiness is being measured. Happiness, which many people will think is very subjective, is now being measured by those big indices. And the idea behind this is to move from things which are easy to measure. It's easy to measure education, what we spend on education. These figures are available. Any government can give you those figures. Uh, and we also know that education is important. It can lead to better lives, healthier and happier lives. You live longer when you are better educated. You tend to participate more actively in civic life, commit fewer crimes, rely on less on social assistance, be less affected by unemployment. But in fact, it's not if you measure education as such, you are not actually using a good proxy because education alone is not the... the the center issue is the quality of education that really matters the most, uh, the nature of this education. And that's why uh, they don't just measure education in terms of uh, spending, but they try to measure education in terms of student skills, for example, because those skills are what affects your employability later on. If you have good skills, you, you have higher chances of being employed. So it's not a matter of having education or having gone to school or university, but having the right skills. So they have their PISA test, which many countries around the world compete, and we hear about the high uh, uh, achievements by countries like Finland and China in this test. And this is their way and approach. And they have other indicators as well, almost a dozen of them. We covered those metrics in a recent paper with WHO a colleague that's mentioned here with the link. But let me now uh, conclude this by a few take-home messages that IoT powered smart cities aim at improving the quality of life. It's all about people and for people. Aim at promoting eco-friendly, sustainable environments and the delivery of better connected healthcare uh, services to citizens, even proactive services that prevent diseases rather than detect them early and cure them. And smart cities and smart uh, regions uh, stand better chances of becoming healthier cities and regions. No wonder the European uh, office of the World Health Organization has embraced uh, my call for smart cities to be an integral part and a pillar in their vision of healthy cities, which is a program they are running since the 1980s. It's currently in phase uh, six, and uh, this program aims at helping cities uh, in Europe, but the WHO is also running a wider program globally to uh, achieve uh, better health outcomes, better living conditions, better well-being, and ultimately happiness to their citizens. Uh, also, we need to remember the issue of standards and protocols. You can't build those huge systems and ensure they work seamlessly without ensuring their plug and playability through standards and protocols. You also need to remember the notion of <coughs> privacy and security and the measures is now early days and it's good that we started thinking about these things and I hope and I expect the, the coming generations of devices and services will take these more into consideration when they are designed and released. We mentioned big data but we also need to remember noise that comes with big data and that is not necessarily uh, an answer to our problems to use big data is just what we need to do is to use the right size data and light analytics, the right sized analytics. Innovation is key to promoting sustainability and without innovation and continuous innovation, you cannot generate economic value, growth, and competitive advantage. You'll find that without innovation, things will come to a plateau and then decline. And that's why companies come up with new ideas all the time, a new version of Windows, a new type of device, a new way of user interfaces. The reason is their survival. The, once they stop doing these things, it's their end. Within a matter of years, they will end. So this is uh, necessary. And rural regions included, they should not be left behind. They need to benefit from this. In fact, what we are witnessing now is the fourth industrial revolution. The digital revolution started in the 1950s, the late 1950s, when we started the digital technology and information age. We are now past the digital age and the information age. We are now into the fourth industrial revolution, which is about the Internet of Things and that blurring between the world of atoms and the world uh, of bits. These are uh, times of new opportunities, new potentials, and we should seize the opportunity for the benefit of our populations. 
there is much more to digital health and health in general than GP care and acute care hospitals, applications, apps, telehealth care, home care for older people, for chronic conditions. All of these things are excellent, and it's excellent to see them moving from the reactive paradigm to the proactive paradigm. But there are many smart services that could engage and benefit our communities while having a direct positive effect on their health, well-being, and overall quality of life. And I'm saying direct effect. It's really health rate and direct. When you think housing, income, jobs, community, education, environment, civic engagement, life satisfaction, safety and policing, work-life balance, which, by the way, are the elements and ingredients that feed into those indices I mentioned earlier by the OECD, you are thinking about health at the end. Ultimately, it's health and well-being and happiness that we want to achieve. Putting people first and foremost and engaging people in the process as creators, not co-creators, they are creators. There is a difference between co-creator and co-producer and creator and producer. They are the maestro because it's for them. The decisions are not made by them. They are not objects of decisions of the government. They should be the decision makers and they shouldn't just be reduced to mere service users. Engaging with citizens is not enough, but it's important. You also need to engage citizens in the whole process, what we call active citizen participation. From design board to service running, even some aspects of service ownership, citizen-centered but also citizen-led approach should be for them and by them, making no one or group excluded or left behind, for example, because of their digital or other literacy uh, issues or their age or social status. Everyone should be included. We have here in the Highlands and Islands almost 800,000 uh, population and uh, maybe more, uh, and we should include all these people, not do a small project that just covers 5,000 or 10,000, and probably during the design and most of the phase of that project, only a bunch or handful of, of those people are involved, and the rest are just you throw the service at them, you have to use this, and we are going to evaluate. This is not the correct model. In fact, there is a new paradigm now emerging in digital health about our thinking of evaluation methodologies and the term evaluation itself and how it should be approached in the context of digital health and other smart uh, services. The European Parliament report I mentioned earlier analyzed a sizable sample of smart city projects and initiatives across 37 cities. They came out with those three key factors. I would like these to be the take-home messages for this lecture. These are vision, people, and process. To have a successful smart city or region, you need to have a vision of inclusion and participation. Uh, you need to have inspiring leaders or city champions who are able to foster participative environments that can empower citizens through active participation to create a sense of ownership and commitment. And you need to have a sound process, including the creation of some coordination, central coordination facility or go between diverse stakeholders. Uh, also, you need to make provisions for open data and other levels of coordination and integration centrally and locally. So these are the ingredients for a smart city or region or smart highlands and islands as well. Let me conclude by some kind of shameless advertising. This is a journal I found and run since 2002. Uh, I started with BMC, and I've seen BMC being taken over by Springer now uh, in Germany. And uh, throughout the years, the journal grew from strength to strength. Our latest impact factor is shown here. But the reason I'm also, besides uh, inviting you, of course, if you are interested to have a look, read, everything is open access, or even submit your research there, if relevant. We also have a special series or collection recently launched about smart, healthy cities and regions. And the call went out for papers also earlier uh, this month or just at the end of March, uh, calling for papers about smart health and healthcare services in the context of smart cities and regions. We have a couple of papers and editorials here, and uh, this could form a kind of uh, nice uh, initial reading for anyone interested in learning further about this topic. Thank you very much.